Straight ahead on CCX News, from pristine to polluted. Definitely makes our recreation experience much less pleasant. What can be done to protect the mighty Mississippi? Plus, a mystery odor in Plymouth forces a business to evacuate. And later, meet a New Hope entrepreneur who sat on pins and needles until he received a financial shot in the arm. CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Water quality in the Mississippi River continues to be an issue in Minnesota. So what condition is the Mississippi in right now? Eric Nelson went out looking for answers to that question. We keep putting waste where we drink constantly. We drink this stuff. We might want to care. From Lake Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River is a dumping ground. And that includes the Northwest Metro. Unfortunately, the Mississippi River in the Twin Cities is still impaired for water quality, does not meet our state water quality standards for phosphorus, for nitrogen, for bacteria. The mighty Mississippi isn't so mighty these days. Phosphorus and nitrogen levels have polluted the river's once pristine waters. The predominant source of phosphorus in the metro Mississippi is agricultural runoff. It's not urban lawns or, or pets. Farmland runoff is carried to the Mississippi by tributaries such as the Crow and Minnesota rivers. This affects everyone who uses it. Definitely makes our recreation experience less pleasant when you're swimming through or trying to recreate in sort of pea green water. In the northwest suburbs, residents can try to keep the river clean by picking up after their dogs and cleaning up yard waste. There's quite a bit we can do. One is rake up, sweep up, pick up. Storm drains suck up phosphorus laden yard debris and it eventually winds up in the Mississippi. River is home, solitude, happiness. For Brooklyn Park native Steve Johnson, seeing the river's demise has been tough. Does everybody need a golf course for a front yard? Let it grow. Let a few bugs enjoy it and Mother Nature maybe, you know. I've uh, seen nature go down the tubes in my life and it's really kind of sad. In Brooklyn Park, I'm Eric Nelson, CCX News. According to Whitney Clark from Friends in the Mississippi River, agriculture produces 57% of the phosphorus in the river. A mysterious gas odor forced the evacuation of a clinic in Plymouth today. The fire department was called twice for a report of a gas odor in the building. Several workers complained of watery eyes and itchy throats. The building was evacuated for several hours while a chemical assessment team checked it out. But getting everyone out of a clinic wasn't easy. The gastroenterology uh, clinic did have some people that were uh, undergoing procedures that we had to wait until they were done. They were under anesthetic and then also some patients that were in a uh, recovery room recovering from anesthetic. So we had to, to work through some of those uh, logistical needs. A biohazard bag mistakenly left in a cleaning space may be the culprit. About 30 people were checked out at the scene. One person was taken to the hospital for evaluation. The Maple Grove City Council this week approved preliminary plans for a unique kind of housing product. A developer is proposing 66 upscale single-family single homes on a 15-acre site along Forest View Lane. The homes in the so-called Mills Creek development would not be for sale, but instead to rent. Rents would range from $1,800 to $2,300. In Robbinsdale, a milestone moment to eventually revitalize a former strip mall. The former Rainbow Food Store is now almost completely demolished. Other parts of the former Terrace Mall site still await the wrecking ball. The demolition will make way for a Hy-Vee grocery store, coffee shop, and a gas station. We now have a better idea what local schools could receive in education funding over the next two years. This after the state of Minnesota, the state Senate that is, passed its education funding bill this week. The Senate proposal increases K-12 funding by $300 million. The House bill calls for a $271 million increase. The governor's proposal more than doubles those amounts. So here's how it breaks down for local school districts. Osseo would get just under $8 million in the Senate plan compared to $9 million in the House and $12 million with the governor. Robbinsdale would also receive much more under the governor's plan, more than double what the House is proposing. And it's a similar story with Wayzata schools. K-12 funding is the largest piece of the Minnesota state budget.
There is reaction from the president of North Hennepin Community College after the Minnesota House approved a higher education funding bill that includes a partial tuition reduction for two-year state colleges. The bill would freeze tuition next school year at two-year colleges such as North Hennepin. For the 2018-2019 school year, there would be a 1% tuition reduction. North Hennepin College President Barbara McDonald says the affordability of a degree is a critical issue. In a statement to CCX News, McDonald said the Minnesota state system is committed to holding undergraduate tuition rates at their current levels if the legislature fully funds their budget request. Otherwise, programs and services are at risk. The Osseo School District is going ahead with a plan to phase out a consultant that works with teachers and staff on diversity training. Instead, that kind of training would be done in-house. Two weeks ago, teachers and community members lined up at a school board meeting to support the consultant's work. The school board was split over the issue. Last night, board member Jim Burgett changed his vote to approve the integration budget, which would phase out the consultant. He said it's a compromise, but time to move the budget forward. Our equity staff needs to get fully funded as we originally planned so that um, the staff gets they get hired, they get paid to do the job, and uh, we want to support them as much as we possibly can. We had a lot riding on the line. You know, this is a $4.2 million budget. The vast majority of it was not involved with Pacific Education Group, and that we needed to move forward because there's so many other pieces of this work that we need to, to keep going on. Others who voted for the budget argued that the consultant wasn't helping to improve the district's graduation rate or closing the achievement gap. A new study shows scams not only can have serious financial consequences on the elderly, but on their caregivers as well. Allianz Life Insurance, based in Golden Valley, conducted the study. Reporter Shannon Slatton spoke with them for today's Money Savers Report. Shannon? Mike and Alex, the numbers are high. When a senior falls victim to a scam, it can hit the pocketbook of their caregiver hard. A lot of times the caregiver has to contribute more money to try to make that uh, person whole. So the average amount was um, $36,000. This study by Allianz Life found the average caregiver spends $7,000 a year and provides more than 10 non-paid hours of care a week. Those costs in that time are exacerbated when the senior has been the victim of financial abuse. Allianz developed a caregiver's readiness guide to help people start the conversation about caregiving and the importance of regular communication with your senior. If you're having kind of daily conversations, um, you're going to uncover a lot of information about, you know, a strange person that visited them or called them up or, you know, found an error in their bank account. You're going to hear more about that so that you can, you know, have your radar up and, and help eliminate the situation before it gets worse. One thing to consider is bringing a third party into your conversation, like another family member or a financial professional, as a way to create checks and balances in your system and help stop that financial exploitation before it starts. And Mike and Alex, Allianz did offer the caregiving readiness guide that I mentioned before. It's full of checklists and all sorts of good information, and we have a digital copy on our website, CCX Media. Great. Tough issue if you have an older parent or grandparent. It absolutely it is. is. All right, Thanks, thank you. Shannon. Well, still ahead on CCX News, a new hope business owner gets a much needed financial boost to help an underserved population. And then a little bit later in sports, a veteran Totino Gray softball team sets its sights on a trip to the state tournament. But first, a warm-up is coming. 50s on Thursday, 60s on Friday, and yes, 70s possible on Saturday. Business in New Hope is offering holistic, inexpensive health care to people who might not be able to afford it. The new company wouldn't be possible without the help of a nonprofit serving minority business owners. Reporter Sonia Goins has the story. All right, so um, you're coming in today for knee pain? Yes. Empower Community Acupuncture opened its doors in December. How long have you had the knee pain? Owner William Wynn grew up in Brooklyn Park and wanted to stay in the Northwest Metro. You could say it's a dream come true to be having my own practice. William Start was unconventional. He was a freelance writer before he got into the traditional Chinese medicine of acupuncture. I actually got into acupuncture because I had, a, had problems with my jaw and I went and saw an acupuncturist 
and it actually helped. And that persuaded me that I could help other people do the same thing. So I went to school for it. The acupuncturist puts tiny sterile needles into the skin and muscles to jumpstart healing. There's nerve endings that are near the surface of the skin. So by putting the needles into the skin, it helps the body to create its own painkillers. William says acupuncture can be used to treat all kinds of things, from low back pain and tennis elbow to other chronic conditions. I can uh, walk normally now. And today I see him for the knee pen. The procedure can poke you hard in the pocketbook, but not here. William charges about half of what it normally costs for acupuncture. And he does the procedure in a group setting, allowing him to see more patients. By reducing the price point that I charge, I am able to bring access to more people who don't necessarily get acupuncture or cannot afford the rates of $70 an hour and above. William says none of this would be possible without assistance from the Metropolitan Economic Development Association. MEDA believes in equal economic participation and economic development through entrepreneurship is one of the main ways we can reduce some of the racial disparities that exist. LaJuana is William's consultant. She tweaked his business plan and financial projections. He would call me up every once in a while with general questions and I kind of helped him navigate locations and those kinds of things. A lot of small things that you have to sort of take into account when you open your own business. So far, business is going well, but yeah, William says the big it. payoff is seeing his clients healthy. I enjoy helping people and um, helping them feel better. In New Hope, Sonia Goins, CCX News. The Williams practice doesn't take insurance. The first session is $35 and returning visits are $25. He says he's willing to work with clients if they can't afford the services. Up next, students get career insight from working professionals, including one you may recognize. <laughs> but first, the Osseo baseball team will have plenty of new faces in the lineup this spring. Jay Wilcox is in next with sports. I'm Jay Wilcox with sports. The Osseo baseball team will have a lot of holes to fill after graduating eight seniors from a team that tied for fifth in the Northwest Suburban Conference last spring. But the Orioles have two solid pitchers and a lot of underclassmen who are eager to play at the varsity level. Here's Jason Malillo with a season preview of the Orioles. With a very young team, the Orioles will be learning on the fly. It's going to be a work in progress. It's going to be a, a lot of learning, a lot of adjusting to the speed of the game. When guys are jumping up two, three levels from uh, their age group in the last year or two. So um, the game is going to go faster for them. And, and they just, you know, and some of them are going to learn on the fly and, and, and adjust to that speed. Osio's only two regular starters coming back are John and Matt Bezdecek. The senior twins will be 1-2 in the pitching rotation. It's good to know that we have two quality starters coming out. It's always finding the guys that will step up, the relievers. High school baseball key is, you know, being able to throw strikes, throw the ball over the plate, uh, getting guys out, getting through games, you know, and it, the experience those guys bring on the bump uh, is going to be huge for our program and our team this year. Osseo was inconsistent last spring, ultimately finishing with a 500 record. Ups and downs will come again this season, but the Orioles hope to progress and improve as they go. It's going to take a while for these guys to adjust, but midway season I see us going, making hopefully a section run, get through first couple rounds, and then pound out the last few games in the section. So I can see us having a late run towards the end of the season. Jason Malillo, CCX Sports. The Orioles open the season Wednesday afternoon at Cooper, and we'll have highlights of that game Thursday starting at 4 on CCX Sports. Their first conference game is next Tuesday at Totino Grace, followed by their home opener Thursday, April 13th against Blaine. Well, the Totino Grace softball team reached the Section 4 3A championship game last spring, losing in the final. A veteran Eagles team hasn't forgotten that game as they get ready for a new season. John Jacobson has their story. It was a tough way to end a season. Tutino Grace's 12-inning loss to Montevideo last spring sent the Zephyrs to state and the Eagles home. It was a heartbreaker for most of us. That was supposed to be, kind of be our big year, and so I think this year we're going to come back and we kind of have the fire in us to just go all the way. We're like pretty much the same team. We lost three seniors uh, last year, so like that definitely fuels us. And that game, like we couldn't hit, so if we like make one or two more hits, we won the game. The Eagles have the talent to go at least as far this season. Pitcher Aaron Pepping has signed with Eastern Carolina and is healthy after a shoulder injury smolder last spring. Among the other returners are outfielders Matty Braun and Matty Doran. 
Infielder outfielder Lexi Radetich. And infielders Ella Ebensteiner and Lauren Scheneman. This much returning varsity experience helps. You've been by each other like a whole through a whole season and um, you can just kind of know what to expect and you know how each other play and so you can feel more comfortable with each other. And the kids kind of know what I expect and, they, and, I, they, and I know what they wanted out of me as a coach and things like that so it's worked out well because I've had a lot of the kids for two or three years. The Eagles say pitching and defense will be the strengths of this team. While getting to state is the ultimate goal, the Eagles say they want to compete better within the Northwest Suburban Conference as well. I know we can win it, but I want to be in the top half. I mean, it's, it's going to get us better for section play because we're not going to see the, the dominating pitching in our section like we're seeing our conference, so that's going to help us in the long run. A mild winter has helped all teams get out earlier than in most years. Eagles hope to still be playing in late spring, too. In front late, John Jacobson, CCX Sports. The Tino Grace will get a challenge in its first game. The Eagles open the season at Maple Grove next Wednesday, a game that you'll be able to see here on CCX. It'll be live on the web at ccxmedia.org and replays on our TV channels 12 and 799 next Thursday night, April 13th at 7 o'clock. Mike and Alex, back to you. All right, thank you. Good to see him outside. Yeah. Well, still ahead, solving the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Students get a unique perspective when we come back. a sign of the times with social networking so popular among high school students teachers worry that students are missing out on valuable communication skills so teachers at the high view alternative program organize speed informational interviews where students in a career planning class could interview working professionals so students asked about job responsibilities things like work schedule and education the process worked like speed dating sort of where students got seven minutes to find out as much as they could Good about a career path. This speed networking event gives students the um, experience to talk to different people from different careers because they'll come in and say, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a nurse, I'm going to uh, go into the Army. We just want them to have their eyes wide open and know what's out there. Well, several career paths were represented from restaurant manager to realtor to reporter. There she is, our own Shannon Slatton answered questions from students as well. And that'll do it. That's it for now. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. We will see you back here Thursday starting at 4 o'clock.